Continuing our story, we have Grimlock Dash Goliath walking around the laboratory and actually, you know, um, just asking Dr. Wu questions. He even walks into a vault to which he can say he smells some kind of metal behind it and wonders just how far have they gotten into the notes of Rockwell? How, if they even discovered where the King Titan is in all honesty. And Dr. Wu tells him, no, they haven't gotten that far here. We were hoping that unfortunately since your condition and he still apologizes for it to which now Grimlock is kind of over at this point he kind of likes the you know beastly side he just enjoys it but again Doctor Who does say he hasn't been able to decipher any of the notes or find the King Titan with any of his equipment or technology they have a couple of theories but none of them solid to which he then walks up to the vampire corpse and says are vampires really real? To which Claire says, oh yeah, and they're not too too fond of us humans. They see us as cattle. To which Grimlock rolls his eyes and says, obviously. But he walks over to the frozen sort of Poseidon, you know, that's been opened up, cut up, and dissected and stuff. And he says, Element can, you know, do this to a creature. And again, Dr. Wu goes over how Element can either corrupt or enhance it depends on what variety you use you see the unstable element that you brought here is very corrupt mm -hmm. and introducing it to anything living is a problem this is when we fast forward to vic hoskins in the jurassic world laboratory and the experimentation going on with dr helen cho as she's really reluctant to do this but again He's in charge, he's giving orders, and Doctor Who hasn't been seen in a while yet. To which, she does tell Hoskins that the corruption is full and total. And actually has, you know, a corrupted uh, Carnotaurus, the one he actually was able to maul. And a couple raptors, let's say around five or six, right? And they look almost zombified in a way. It's horrifying even. The sheer fact that these corrupted creatures even exist is quite terrifying here. And this is where they're trying to haul in Rexy as well. Rexy can not only smell the corruption, but is beginning to get uneasy about it. And as soon as that door opens and she's able to get a good look at the Carnos and Raptors, she goes ballistic, actually begins to tear apart the facility and the laboratory that she's in. The soldiers try and scramble, but again, they can't, they can't do anything for some reason. They can't, they're, they're unable to get a solid foothold on themselves. It's kind of been a bad day for these soldiers as a whole here. But again, they try to scramble to get their weapons, but Rexy's just throwing stuff around. She's ramming through things, and it goes to the point where she busts out the facility and begins to run off. Hoskins, seeing this as an opportunity, deploys the corrupted dinosaurs and tells them to go after Rexy. Remember, he still, you know, has that corrupted element in him, so it should give him at least a small form of control. This is when an alarm goes off in the underwater laboratory, and Dr. Wu and Claire both find out that Hoskins has created these corrupt dinosaurs and that they're going after Rexy. And this is where Grimlock says, enough is enough that this ends today. And Dr. Wu says, wait a minute, you shouldn't be out there. You shouldn't do this. We don't know how the element is going to react to you. To which it says he's been able to bite Hoskins before, and this time he's going to finish what he started. And to which he simply leaves through an underwater, you know, exit here, actually turning into his Goliath form and swimming at a very impressive speed. To which Dr. Wu says, huh, I guess that DNA did come in handy. And this is where we fast forward to Rexy thrashing around these creatures. She's trying her best here, but they do kind of get like the best of her until Goliath comes in and actually tackles the Carnotaurus off of her. They actually have a little bit of a back and forth here, but it's not very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not very, I guess you could say intense here, with Goliath kind of analyzing the Carnotaurus more than um, simply participating in the fight itself here. And he just smacks it with a rock. <laughs> I swear the rock smack is just about to be, you know, the signature move of the series. But again, it kind of is anyway. And the Carnotaurus is able to take it surprisingly well. To which Goliath simply looks at it like, 
wait a minute, huh? You, you actually was able to withstand that. But as the Carnotaurus charges in, Goliath simply pins it with one arm and then burns it. This actually causes an element explosion to which it picks up on the raptors and the aftermath of the fire exploding just simply just burnt, you know, pops all the raptors like they're nothing more than balloons here. And this is where Rexy gives off her triumphant roar and Goliath pretty much beats his chest like King Kong here and gives off his triumphant roar. To which the two look at each other and Rexy walks in the opposite direction, much to Goliath's surprise. But he examines the, you know, I guess you get the contents of the exploded creatures here and sees that it's a little bit of element dust, this blue like dust that's been, I guess you could say, left as the remains of them. But this is where he gets shot in the back by a tank here. And he looks and the shot did absolutely nothing but just kind of stagger him a bit here. And realizing that these shots now do nothing to him, he wonders how tough he actually is. And Hoskins, seeing this as well, actually states that, you know, you could still join us. It's not too late to correct your mistake. And this is as soldiers and a bunch of these, like, you know, tanks and other dino, you know, killing vehicles just come around here. And Goliath roars in defiance. He's not going anywhere with Hoskins, and he's not doing it anytime soon. This is when they open absolute, sorry, not open, rain absolute hell on Goliath, shooting him from all angles, a leap smash. But this leap smash is on such a level that it shakes the entire island. It unleashes a burn wave or a fire wave, if you will, that annihilates the tank or anyone in the vicinity. Anyone who survives at this point is absolutely fair game. And they can't do anything at this point here. Their bullets don't work. Their rockets don't work. They can't even wear, try wear and tear damage because again, Goliath has evolved to a point where nothing that they can do can simply harm him. He tears through them, burns them, even eats them. Again, these soldiers are nothing in comparison to him. And all it does is make him angrier and angrier and angrier, resenting Hoskins even more here. They try to run, some of them even running into the jungle, but Goliath is on them in a heartbeat, actually leaping after them, snatching them up and crushing them either in his hands or simply stepping on them. And again, in his jaws, it does not matter to him. However, this is where he's actually hit with a rock upside his head and it actually causes him to topple over a bit. And he actually sees Hoskins in his corrupted form standing there. Hoskins tells him, or at least tries to tell him that he's ruined everything. But Goliath isn't having it and pounces on him almost immediately. Hoskins tries to get his bearing. He's trying to hold back this now enraged and non-holding back Goliath here. But... It's not enough here. Hoskin tries to throw a punch and Goliath catches it, bites it, and then puts his full force behind that bite and crushes the arm like it's nothing. Crushes it and rips it off. All right. It, it, basically, the bite shatters every ligament, every tendon, like it's nothing more than a chew toy. And Hoskins, now with only one arm, is scared, saying he can't do this. He... He shouldn't be able to harm him. He tries to run, but Goliath grabs him by the leg and breaks it. He then picks Hoskins up and rips him in half. This actually satisfies him, and he's happy he finally got to do this. As he throws the remains to the ground, he hears a helicopter overhead, and this is where we would have our time skip. It's now during a completed Jurassic World here, and everything's changed here on this island. It's so much different now. The park is not only beefed up on security, but has repaired all the damage that has been done here. However, some things have happened. You see, the Leap Smash created a crater that was actually deep enough for them to build the Mosasaur exhibit. However, the Mosasaur wouldn't be the only aquatic creature here. And I know you guys are wondering, okay, get to the point. 
what happened to Grimlock or what happened to Goliath here? Well, that's pretty simple here. The underwater laboratory is now sort of his base of operations into where he could study everything. And he's given up on eating the dinosaurs, or at least partially here. He's also responsible for wrangling in some of the tougher dinosaurs, such as the Spinosaurus. And they actually gave the Spinosaurus a mate. And within that year, they've actually begun to start a family. So now he's no longer lonely. Then you also have Buck and Doe, also with Junior here, and now in the same enclosure as Rexy. At least a large amount of space here is given to them. But again, they're in the same enclosure and they're living happily. And some new dinosaurs were made here. The Seismosaurus, the Epimosaurus, Dinochirus, Therizinosaurus. You know, creatures that people would also enjoy and love. And here's the thing. There's also an arctic exhibit as well here there's a or at least a pleistocene exhibit where they actually make things like mammoths saber tubes me megalanias megalo well, sorry not megalodons i don't think they would actually go that far basilosaurus would probably be more realistic here and grimlock actually uses this as not only a means to train but to build up his human form a whole lot more here you see, using this and using the creatures here, he actually spars with them, trains them, and actually just kind of participates as kind of like this super strong man, not revealing his beast form to the public here. And often he spars with the creatures that he knows are, well, that he knows can actually harm him, actually building up that reputation here for being one of the world's strongest men, or if not the strongest men in the world here. And he would have been paid handsomely for not only being the head of security and the head dino wrangler, but again, for being the resident strongman for entertainment on the island. And honestly, I don't think I would end it here. No, no, no. I would actually have him decipher Rockwell's notes here. You see, I think with his DNA or his DNA being similar to that of the King Titan, and the King Titan being possibly one of Rockwell's creations because of the element, it'll have allowed him to not only understand the notes, but actually be able to read them more fluently and being able to decipher things Dr. Wu couldn't, even allowing him to open the vault and him discovering the Arc Tech. Now, Arc Tech is definitely more advanced than regular tech, and I think that's pretty simple here. And he would have understood how to really communicate with these creatures here. And this would have allowed him to actually not only befriend the Shastasauruses, but to actually own them. Even, you know, getting permission from Maserani to actually own these creatures himself here. And again, building up that reputation for the island, you know, he would have actually been able to do it. And actually using the Arc Tech would have actually made himself a submarine out of the Shastasaurus, obviously. And the Shastasaurus he uses is pretty much the lead male here which I'm going to call Moby, after Moby Dick. Yeah, it kind of makes sense since Shastasaurus are going to be the whales of Ark now. And he's able to decipher the King Titan's notes, but again, he also finds out there's an organization named Orchid. But that's not where we leave it off here. No, 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 no. You see, he feels like he's being watched for some reason. He feels like something's in here with him, or someone. And as he takes out one of his newer weapons here, being his sword and shield. Yep. Yep. We're giving him that. Yeah, we definitely are here. And he actually tells the person to come out and face them. And they actually do. Wielding two blades, two very specialized blades with an electrical impulse. And as the female actually attacks him here, the woman here, she actually you know, tries to kill him, actively trying to kill him. Seeing this, he bothers not to hold back. And as soon as she thinks she has the upper hand, he retaliates by actually gutting her with his sword, putting it away and begins to beat her barehanded so he can at least not destroy any information that's on her. And again, it's very one-sided here because now she has to hold her gut and he's just welling on her, just beating the absolute mess out of her and actually begins to cave her skull in. You see, the strength difference is massive. And the thing is, he's trying not to damage her too badly, but he is intended on killing her. And this is where he actually takes a note off of her to where it says, 
come to New York to find all the information that you need. Knowing that this is a trap, or it might be a trap, Goliath decides to take Moby with him, or at least take him as transportation, and decides to head for New York City. With the only person he tells about this is Claire, who relays this information to both Maserani and Dr. Wu. And that's where we're going to leave it off here, you guys. Who invited Grimlock to New York? Who was the woman that hunted him? And is he going there to basically get set up into a trap? Who knows what's going to happen to him when he enters that city? But hey, that's going to be all today, you guys. Please comment down below, like, and subscribe, and share with your friends. And I'll see you guys for chapter five. Peace.